Make sure your Bible is still open there to Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Look at verse number 9. It's again our jumping off verse. The thought that the passage is based upon, and I believe the whole psalm is. Verse number 9. For our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. I want to preach this morning on a tale worth telling. A tale worth telling. The question here in this psalm, which is a prayer of Moses, the question then as it is now, what tale is your story, is your life telling? He said, we're passing our years, we're going through our years, verse number 9, as a tale that is told. What tale is your life telling? What story is your life telling? When it's all said and done, what will your story be? What will your tale be? I've preached not as many as some men, but I've preached a good number of funerals. You've probably been to a lot of funerals. And really, a memorial service or a funeral often comes down, as folks give testimony, they start reciting the tale of the person's life what they remember, what they saw, what that person was like. Some of those tales that they tell, kind of sad. By that I mean if it's the best you could say about somebody is they could really play video games. That's a pretty sad tale. Or somebody says, well, they traveled a lot, so they really enjoyed travel. Nothing wrong with travel. I enjoy traveling. But if that's the sum total of your tale, that's pretty sad. Or, well, they, they had a good sense of humor, or uh, they had a nice house. You compare that with somebody who might say, on the opposite side, if somebody has some good tales, some good testimonies, some good stories, say, they led me to the Lord. They showed me how to be saved, how to go to heaven and escape hell. They brought me into the church. They showed me how to read the Bible. They showed me how to study. They built me up. They taught me to be a good mother. They taught me to be a good father. They were a good example of how to, to guide my household, to guide my family. What a great difference that is. So the question is this morning, what's your tale telling? What is your story telling? So not just at the end of this life, what will your tale be? He said, we're spending our whole life. What will it be? But not just at your funeral, what will it be beyond the funeral? Because let's be, let's be honest. When our funeral comes, and if Jesus tarries, you're going to have one. You'll be the focal point. But after a funeral, most people are kind of forgotten. You might be remembered as daddy for a while and then grandpa, but after a generation, let's be honest, you're just on somebody's family tree. But your life can still have an effect after you're gone. Your tale can still have an effect after they've forgotten your name. Your story can still have an impetus after you're gone. You may be just on the family tree, great-great-grandma or great-great-grandpa. They may not even know why they're in church. They may not even know why their family is, it is the way it is. But God knows and the family would know you'll have an impact. Your tale worth telling had an impact for generation to come, whether they know your name or not. But beyond that, God always knows the tale that your life had. So I'm asking today, what's your tale that's worth telling because we think about let's put it this way the bible talks about the judgment seat of christ we as christians one day will stand before god and give an account the bible says of what we did in this life as a christian for the judgment seat of christ the bema seat that's not a determination whether you go to heaven or hell it's just a giving of rewards and determining what you did we'll give an account in other words god will call us up the bible says individually and talk about our tale what our story was. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it profitable? Was it unprofitable? Did it help people? Did it hurt people? Was it glorifying God or was it not glorifying to God? That is the tale told at the judgment seat. I want my tale told at the judgment seat, be one to giving honor and glory to God. I want my tale told at the judgment seat, the one where we can hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That is my desire. Look again, verse number nine. We spend our years, we're spending our life as a tale that is told. Everyone has a tale. I think of folks, and if you allow me to mention it, people in hell today are reliving their tale that is told. The Bible tells us in Luke 16, it tells us about the rich man died and in hell, and he began to think, he began to remember. I believe people in hell are reliving their tale, if you will, that is told. 
about how they said no to Jesus Christ, how they said no to the gospel invitation, how they said no to the Bible, how they said no to, to finding out about how to be saved. At the great white throne judgment, that final judgment for the end of time in Revelation talks about how the, the people, the dead will be brought up, those that were never trusted Christ, those that were never saved. And the books will be open, and the book of life will be open one last time to verify they're not written in the Lamb's book of life. And just before they cast into hell, their tale is told as they're judged by the works. Verse 9 says, Our years are spent as a tale that is told. I want my tale to be worth telling. Something of value. Something glorifying God. I trust that that's why you're here today. You want that in your life. And God's going to spell it out on how we can have a tale worth telling. How at the end we can say, my tale is worth telling. Now, regardless of what age you are, you say, well, preacher, I'm old. I'm ancient. I'm, I'm, I'm over the hill. I'm 30 years old. Remember when you used to think people that were 30 were over the hill? We can't change the past, but we can change our tail from here on. We can say, starting today, my tail is going to be different. Starting today, the tale of my life, the tale being told when it's all said and done, is going to be one of value. It's going to be a tale worth telling. All of us have known some people that you look at their life and say, their life is a tale worth telling. And you like talking about how they impacted you and what they did. And you often think about what a blessing they are. We've often talked about people also that had tales that were not worth telling, that were just kind of shameful or just of no consequence. So we're looking today at how to have a tale worth telling. So I'm asking you to listen, not with just your head, but with your heart, and let God do them a great work that our tale will be worth telling when it's done. Just by way of introduction, what is this psalm about? The psalm, as we saw, is a prayer of Moses. A prayer of Moses. Hope you're praying. Moses was a man of prayer. He was a man of God. As we look at this prayer, don't be fearful about having God judge our prayer based upon eloquence. You know, God is not impressed at one iota with how well you say words when you pray. I mean, you can get yourself all psyched up and you can get all the thee and the thou and thou art and God's not impressed one little bit. So we look at God's, uh, Moses' prayer and it's powerful there, not because it was eloquent, because it had a purpose. Our prayer can be modeled not after eloquence, but it'll be modeled after its purpose. We read through here, he had a purpose in his prayer. He had a desire in his prayer. He had a, a, a direction in his prayer. He had a passion in his prayer. He had a humility in his prayer. He was praying for others. In fact, the Bible says Moses was very meek above all men that were on the face of the earth. So he had a great prayer. Now, to understand what he's writing about here as he talks about in this chapter how to have a tale worth telling, how to have a life that's worth something at the end, we need to understand when this prayer existed. This prayer was written when the children of Israel were in the wilderness. This prayer was written when the children of Israel had gone between Egypt and the Canaan land. In other words, the children of Israel had left home. They had a home in Egypt. True, they were slaves, but it was still home. True, they got beaten, but at the end of the day, they got to go home. At the end of the day, they still had their family. At the end of the day, I mean, we often focus the fact they were slaves and they were beaten and they were abused. Yes, but they had a place where they went to. They had a place where they went home at night. They had a place where their family was. It was home. It was a place secure. It was a place special. Though well, they may not have had much, no doubt they had some special things in their life, special things in their home. And so they had a home in Egypt as slaves. Well, God, after they cried to God to deliver them out of slavery, He brought them out of Egypt. He had them leave their homes, taking them to Canaan, to the promised land, to homes where God says, I'm going to give you homes that you didn't build. I'm going to give you farms you didn't plant. I'm going to give you blessings you can't imagine. It's going to be a much better home where you're not going to be the slaves. You're going to be the masters, and you're going to have a great home. And so they left that home of, in Egypt as slaves. It was home. By the way, how many are glad you got a home to go to? What a blessing. It's just, no matter how big or small, it's, it's, it's home. But they left that place, headed to the promised land of a great home. But we know the story. The children of Israel, when they got to the Canaan, they got to the promised land, they said, we won't go in. We're afraid. We won't go. They rebelled against God. And so God said, all right, you won't go in. You worry the enemy's going to kill your kids. You don't get to go in, but your kids get to. So for the next 40 years... 
they wandered in the wilderness. For 40 years, they waited for anybody over the age of 20 to die. He said, I've got to wait for the whole generation. Anybody 20 or over is going to die before you go in. That's kind of discouraging. So for the next 40 years, they didn't have a home. For the next 40 years, they didn't have a place to go to. They lived in tents, and the tents moved around as the pillar of fire or the cloud would move. Some days it would stay there for days, weeks, months at a time. Sometimes it would be just a few hours. They'd pack up home. They had no home. For 40 years, their days, their calendars were basically marked with funerals, waiting for a generation to pass away. But it was during that time, as he wrote this prayer, it was during that time as God speaks to us through that prayer, he's saying, you can still have a life that matters. You can still have a, a life that has a tale that's worth telling. So for 40 years, they're wandering around in tents, eating manna, stuff they pick up off the ground every day, drinking water out of the rock, waiting for everyone over 20 to, to die. But in that time, he said, listen, while that's happening, while you have no home, how's your tale? Let's have a tale. Let's have a story. Let's have our life that's worth something. So this morning, we're going to look at what God says, how to have that life, that tale, that's worth telling. You are telling your tale right now. You are building your story right now. If you died right now, and, and somebody will, may very well die in this room today before the day's over, and we have the funeral this next week, what will your tale be? Let's start building a tale worth telling. Let's learn from it. Very quickly tonight, number one. Let's know, are you with me this morning? Let's go with it. Number one. If we're going to have a tale worth telling, we need to live a disciplined life. We need to live a disciplined life. Well, we're living in a time and age where there is no discipline. We just do what we want when we feel like it. We go to bed when we want. We get up when we feel like it. The idea of having a set regimented time, doing certain things in certain ways, we just, it's alien to us. But that's why we don't have a tale that's worth telling. Here he says we must live a disciplined life. Look at verse number 12. So the key for the whole passage, for the whole prayer, is that verse number 9, which says, We spend our years as a tale that is told. So how do we get a disciplined life? What does that mean? Look at verse 12. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So we find, so teach us. A disciplined life talks about receiving instruction. Receiving instruction. He said, God, teach us. He said, we're in the wilderness, but teach us. We don't have a home, but teach us. We're just going out and picking up manna every day off the grass out there and bringing it home and eating it, but teach us. He said, we're waiting for a generation to pass off the way, but teach us. A disciplined life means receiving instruction. Now, let me help you. I spent a lot of years in education. In the Navy, I was an instructor, and I got out of the Navy and was an instructor at nuclear power plants, did some instructing even while we were starting the church and had to go back to work. So I've done a lot of teaching. One of the keys that they teach you about teaching is no learning is done unless there's a change in behavior. No learning is really done until there's a change in behavior. If there's no change, there was no learning that took place. There was a lot of teaching, but no learning. There was a lot of maybe gaining some head knowledge, but no teaching. No real learning took place until there was a change. When he says, Lord, teach us, that idea of receiving instructions, there needs to be a change. No change, no real instruction. No change, no real education. And so we think about spiritual matters, we think about this. He said, Lord, teach us. In other words, he says, don't just tell us about it. Instruct us. Give us something that will change our lives. You know, as a pastor, pastors, sometimes we'll hear folks, oh, what a wonderful message. Good message. Thank you. That blessed me. And preachers, sometimes that, they like a pat on the back a little bit. That's all right. But what the preacher's really looking for is the Holy Spirit doing a change in all our lives. What's an amazing thing is I see folks sometimes they say, good message, preacher, wonderful message, preacher, what a blessing. Sunday after Sunday, month after month, year after year, but no change. Guess what? Oh, what a wonderful message. I really learned a lot. No, we didn't. We just heard a lot. We memorized a lot. But we weren't instructed. It's that change that comes about. So what is, let me ask you, what has God changed in your life in the last six months? What change has happened? You say, preacher, I've been saved uh, 
522 years, and I was on the ark with Noah. I don't need to change. No, we've all got to change. We've all still got places to grow and still places to learn. So it's teaching us, receiving instructions. I must change. I must grow. So a, if we're going to have a, listen, a tale worth telling, a life worth telling about, we have to have discipline enough to receive instruction. Listening to the Word of God, heeding the Word of God, letting the Word of God do something in our life, receiving instructions, but not just receiving instructions. By the way, disciplined enough to receive instruction. God said it, so I'm going to do it. God guided me, so I'm going to obey. God did it, so I'm going to have discipline to let God change me. That takes a disciplined life. To receive instruction, but also a disciplined life to apply wisdom. To apply wisdom. Look what it says in verse number 12. So teach us. Now again, remember, they're in the wilderness. They've got no home. They've got, he said, but teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. There needs to be the application of our hearts to wisdom about being wise. If we're going to live, if we're going to have a life worth telling, a tale worth telling, we need a, a life that's wise living in wisdom, learning to apply the wisdom of God to our hearts. How many believe God is wise? Oh, He's wise. He's much wiser than all of us. We need to take that wisdom the Bible talks about from God and apply it, and when we do, we will have a tale worth telling. Our life won't be, well, they sure played a good video game. Oh, they really liked to travel, and I enjoyed their slides when they went on vacation. No, there'll be something that means something for all eternity. It's the applying to wisdom. You know, the Bible tells us a lot about wisdom. Let me give you just two that God says we need to apply our hearts to. Two that God says, Lord, teach us to apply our hearts to this wisdom. Wisdom number one is the winning of souls. Is the winning of souls. Proverbs 11.30, I'm teaching a class on it right now in this 10 o'clock hour. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. It's a wise thing to tell people about the gospel. It's a wise thing to tell people Jesus died to keep them out of hell. It's a wise thing to tell people about how much God loved them. He died on the cross to pay their sin. It's a wise thing. It's wise for them. It's wise for you. It's wise for the country. It's wise to do it. We ought to be praying, God, teach me to apply wisdom, to apply that heart to see people saved. In Matthew 7, there's another one about wisdom. We need to apply have discipline. By the way, it takes discipline. If we don't set out to do it, it's not going to happen. In Matthew 7, 24, Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Again, it's the doing. It's the change. It's the applying. And doeth them. I will hearken him, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. The hearing and doing of the word of God is wise. We are wise to heed the word. Amen? Talk, remember, we get out of here on time a little faster if you talk back to me. We get out. It's wise. He said, Lord, teach us to apply our hearts to wisdom. It's this disciplined life. If we don't let the Holy Spirit discipline us, if we don't let God take control of my will and my spirit, I will not have a tale worth telling. I will just have a life. Well, he lived it, had a good life, uh, had a nice house, and had, was kind of kind to his kinfolk a little bit. But... Uh, no, a life worth telling, a disciplined life, receiving instructions. Man, receive the Word of God. Let the change happen, and then apply wisdom. A disciplined life takes work, takes the work of God in our lives. Secondly, if we want to have a tale worth telling, we must live a discriminating, discerning life. A discerning life. we got folks living life and just not thinking about anything. Not trying to evaluate anything. It's amazing you get to the end of your life and you've never been thinking about anything, you never planned anything, you never discerned anything, and wonder why your life amounted to nothing. We need a discerning life, an understanding life. Notice what it says. Verse number 12, So teach us, here's the discerning, to number our days. We need to number our days. Keep track of our days. Evaluate our days. Redeem the time. To preacher, how can I do that? How can I discern that, have that discerning heart? We need to receive our days as precious. We need to receive our days as precious because they are so few. 
few. If we took some people and lined them up here, for the sake of time, I somebody about 10 years old, 12 years old, and put them here. Took somebody about 20 years old and put them here. Took somebody about 30 years old and put them here. Took somebody about 40 years old and put them here. Somebody 50 years old and put them here. Somebody 66 years old and put them here. There you see the spectrum of time. The 12-year-old looks at this end of the line and says, Boy, that's eternity. <laughs> Remember when you were 12, somebody 66, you'd say, Why are they still living? I didn't know rocks lived that long. It is just amazing. So the little 12-year-old looks ahead and says, That's eternity, 66 years. Those on this side looking back that way and said, It was just yesterday. Just yesterday. I was 20. Just yesterday. A discerning life is one who will number the days and say, I need to understand that these days are precious. Receive the day as precious because there's so few. Let me help you with something. If we can catch a glimpse, this is how we solve that problem. Now, I know days can seem like they go forever and years are just like a moment. But here's how we can solve that. We need to catch a glimpse of the real lifespan as God sees it and as it really is. If we can see life span as it is, because that's how God sees it, and it's so, it'll change everything we look at how precious it is. In fact, take a look at it in verse number 4. For a thousand years in thy sight. A thousand years. How many years, class? A thousand. A thousand. That's a long time. In our picture, that's a long time. You, we just celebrated the 245th birthday of our nation. 245 years. We say, oh, that's a long time. No, we're talking about a thousand years. Nations come and go multiple times in a thousand years. Civilizations come and go multiple times in a thousand years. Generation upon generation. I mean, you might know who your grandpa was and your great grandpa was, but you can't trace your family back a thousand years. That's a long time. History, civilizations, come and go. Verse 4, for a thousand years in thy sight, as he's praying to God, are but as yesterday when it is past. He says, just like being yesterday. A thousand years go by and it's just like this. Well, that was yesterday. We think about the day before yesterday and the week before. It's just like yesterday. And as a watch in the night. If you've been in the military, you've stood watches at night. The Romans and the Jews had different watches through the night. You might have the watch between 9 o'clock and midnight, and then the midnight to 3 and 3 to 6. Those are just watches, just a few hours, just a portion of the night. God says to him that a thousand years is like just a part of that. I mean, when you go to sleep and the watchmen go there through the night, and different people come in on different shifts, and they go through the night, it's just a part of the night. He said, that's what a thousand years is to God. It's just a drop in the bucket. It's just a moment in time. It's just a few hours. That's what God sees as a thousand years. So if we can see it from God's perspective, a thousand years is just like just a part of a watch in the night. How fast is our 70 years? If a thousand years is a flash... Ours is just a spark. Preacher, how can I have a disciplined life? How can I have a discerning life to make sure that I make the changes in my life, to let God do a work in my life, that I can have a tale worth telling? See our life as God sees it, just as a flash. Every day is precious. I mean, I've just got just a second, just a second. With a thousand years in truth, our 15 to 70 years is just an just a flash. That age 12 child to the ancient of days, just a flash. But you'll sit there like I did and like most folks do at 20 and 30 and 40 and say, I got plenty of time. No, <laughs> it's gone. And we wonder why we have a tale not worth telling. Because we did not live a discerning life. They're precious. It's a flash. Very quickly, we must receive our days as precious. So important. Every single day. Don't waste it. Don't waste a day. I have to remind myself, don't waste a day, but do what God would have you do. Secondly, we need to recognize our days are prescribed. Recognize our days are prescribed. Look at verse number 10. The days of our years 
are threescore years and ten. And God's saying here, in general, you can expect an average lifespan to be 70 years, three score and 10. And if by reason of strength, they be four score years, 80 years. Now, not if Moses lived longer than that, God doesn't say everybody's going to live that. But when you look at your lifespan, that's a general expectation. You get three score and 10, 70 years, that's a normal expected life. Somebody dies at age 70, you say, well, they had a full life. Until you get 66 and you say, no, they, they were robbed. But he says in general, three score and ten. He said, but by reason of strength, if God gives them strength, they'll be four score years, 80 years. But God goes on and says, but those last ten years aren't going to be that pleasant. Notice what he says. Yet their strength, what years? Those last ten years. Their strength, labor, and sorrow. Boy, the older you get, the harder it gets. You know what I'm talking about? It's just harder to get up. It's harder to, to start the car. It's harder to wash the house. It's harder to clean the house. What used to take you two hours, now it takes you five hours. It just gets it just gets harder. And God says that. But He says this is the normal lifespan, 70 years, maybe by strength 80, or maybe beyond. But it's prescribed. But I want you to notice, He's praying for people who are not going to get that. Remember, 40 years they're going to walk in the wilderness till that generation 20 years older is dead. So if you're 21... And God says, because you rebelled, you don't get to go in. And in 40 years, you're only 61. Some of those folks weren't going to get three score and ten. Wow. But Moses says, God's telling us through Moses in this prayer, he said, but still make your tale worth telling. Still make your life of value. Still number your days. Still figure out, God, please help us learn to have a discerning life that we can have a tale worth telling when it's all said and told because it's prescribed. We don't know how many days we have, but we need to live them in a discerning manner Realize they're prescribed, so we get the fullness out of it. In fact, in Job, in Job 14, 5, it says, Seeing his days are determined. Job says, God's determined our days. The number of his months are within, are with thee. God knows the number of a month, and has appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Job tells us and reminds us, God's got our expiration date written down, and you're not going to change it. If there's bounds, there's a bound. It's not going to go on. When God says, I'm taking you home, you can say, give me another hour. No, not going to happen. Not now. Wait a while. No, he said it's bound. It's not going any farther. It's prescribed. Our days are prescribed. In fact, in Job 31, verse number 4, before, what do they call those exercise watches? Fitbits? Okay, here's the spiritual Fitbit. In Job 31, 4, doth not he, speaking about God, see my ways and count all my steps? I'm not into step counting. Anybody here count their steps? You got to watch and you're looking for, what is it, a million steps? How many steps are you supposed to take a day? 10,000. Oh, you made, your little alarm goes off. Wow, well, you did 10,000 steps. There's a Hebrew word for that. It's called whoopee. <laughs> but Job says, God counts my steps. God is not counting how many you take. He's taking how many you're counting down to. Job says, he's got bounds. My days are numbered. My steps, God knows how many steps are left. And right now, that step you took to take you to that pew, you don't know you're just that much closer to the last step. Our days are prescribed. Preacher, how can I have a life, a tale worth telling? Let's live a discerning life because I know these days are precious because they're only so few, but what I have are prescribed by God. Teach us to number our days. Discerning. But we're just so bullheaded, we just live life and wonder why our tale's not worth telling. Very quickly, discern our days, we reflect on our days that are passing. We reflect on our days that are passing. Again, verse number 9. For our days are passed away. They're going. They're going. They're ticking by. In thy wrath, we spend our years as a tale that is told. What will our tale be when our, day, when our years are passed? What will it be? They're passing away. We spend our years as a tale. By the way, how are you spending your years? How are you spending them? How did you spend yesterday? I'm not saying you can't spend time with family, can't say all those things are right, but how did you spend them? If, the, if all your life, if all your years was spent like yesterday, would your tale be worth telling? Or would you be ashamed of it? 
Again, I'm not saying we can't take time off, not saying we can't take vacations. In fact, Jesus still tried to pull his disciples away so they could rest. But it, how are you spending your years? Yeah, here's a tidbit that will help us in spending our years. I think it's there in your notes. We can live our lives now as we will then in our eternal God. We can live our years now as we will then in our eternal God. Look at verse number 1. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place, where we live, where we reside, where we keep ourselves in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Moses, remember, he, <laughs> they're in the wilderness, in tents, no houses, no permanent place. They can't say, this is where I keep my tent and this is where I live. No, they're moving around. Yet Moses said, here in the wilderness, he said, he said, Moses, where do you live? In the everlasting God is where I live. He said, I dwell in the everlasting God. Whoa! He said, preacher, I don't have much of a house. That's right, don't dwell there. Dwell in the everlasting God. Oh, preacher, I don't have much money to live. Doesn't make difference. I dwell in the everlasting God. They were living in the wilderness, eating manna, Drinking the water from the rock, no place. Some of them are just waiting to die to go into the promised land. And he says, but I said, we dwell, we live in God. I'm glad. You say, preacher, where do I live in the slums. Don't live there. Live in the everlasting God. Preacher, I live in the penthouse. Don't live there. Dwell in the everlasting God. Dwell in Him. Glory. No one. If we can keep that, we'll get the right discerning heart. If we can keep that, we'll have the wisdom we're going after. If we can remember that we're dwelling and living in Him, boy, then we will have that understanding heart, that discriminating heart that we need. Whoa. Oh, I live in a nice house that I've worked for and I'm taking care of. Well, you ought to take care of it and I'm glad you got a nice house. I, Lord's blessed us with a nice place to live. But when you get down to it, no, I'm dwelling in the everlasting, just like I will for all eternity. That leads us to the next point. If we're going to have a life, a tale worth telling, we must live a delightful life. A delightful life. How many here want to have a happy life? Rest of you, I got a, I'll sign you up for a psychiatrist that's out here after me. Man, we all want a happy life. Look at verse 14. See, when I when I tell my tale, I want it to have joy. I want it to be blessed. I want it to be delightful. Verse 14. Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Preacher, how can I have a delightful life when I've got problems? Notice he says, they've been afflicted. For years they had seen evil. Days they've been afflicted. Yet he's talking about make us glad and rejoicing, verse 14, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years where we have seen evil. Life can be tough, but we can still have a delightful life. What are you talking about? Number one, be satisfied. Be satisfied. The Bible talks about over and over about us being satisfied. Notice what he says. Oh, satisfy us early. Satisfy us early with thy, what class? What are we supposed to be satisfied with? Verse 14, Oh, satisfy us early with thy what? With thy what? Mercy. Satisfy me with lots of money. No, satisfy me with mercy. Satisfy me with good health. No, satisfy me with thy mercy. <laughs> See, the problem is we're dissatisfied because we're looking for the wrong things. The only thing... The only thing that really satisfies is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only place we're really going to find satisfaction to our souls, all our lives, is going to be in God. You say, well, I'll be satisfied and I just get a nicer car. Yeah, until it rusts out. Or until that guy behind you on 680 totals it for you. Or if you have teenagers. Oh. We had four teenagers. I could take you to any car we had while we had teenagers learning to drive. That's Pam's first dent. That's Mike's first dent. This whole section is Jeff's first dent. How many know what we're talking about? This one my wife must have done. This one wasn't my fault. 
It was that other guy. I'd... No, satisfaction comes in His mercy. In His mercy. Boy, just being satisfied. Satisfied in His mercy. See, if I can be satisfied in His mercy, then I can live a life that gives me a tale worth telling. But if I'm only satisfied with money and I'm struggling with money and I'm pushing on money and I'm pushing on position, I'm pushing all these things of the world, all of a sudden I'll find my tale done and it's not worth telling. But it's worth telling when I'm satisfied with His mercy. Very quickly, notice not just by His mercy, but satisfied early. Early. I'm saying that to remind those folks who don't know, the sun comes up slowly. I mean, there's some generations that don't know that. They wake up at 10 o'clock, whoop, sun's up. No, the sun comes up slowly, early. Notice what it says. Oh, satisfy us. Again, they're in the wilderness, no home, no permanent place. Most of them just waiting to die. Even the kids are waiting for the grandparents and parents to die so they can go to prom. That's just a, he said, but have a tale worth telling. The way you do that is, oh, Lord, please satisfy us. Satisfy us. Let God satisfy us early with thy mercy. Early. Very quickly, that means early in the day. It means two aspects, early in the day. All of us, if we're honest, the days we have not been satisfied with God early have not turned out to be good days. We, do, we get up, we get up late, we don't make a purpose to get up early enough to spend time with God, we don't pray, we don't read the Bible, we don't give God our lives, we don't give God our heart, we don't say, God, it's your day, lead me and guide me, protect me, show me what to do, keep me the right spirit, help me have a forgiving heart, and all the things we need to ask for regularly and daily, but we just skip that part, and we go out by 10 o'clock in the morning, we're in trouble. We are unsatisfied, we are dissatisfied, we are discontent, and we are not ready to build a tale worth telling. But do it early. Psalm 5, 3 and other verses say, My voice, speaking to God, shall I hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. Can God expect to hear your voice in the morning? I hope He can. I hope He can. I hope He can. Hope he, ho I hope God's not just hoping. I hope He's expecting to hear your voice. My voice shall I hear in the morning. So, be satisfied early with God in the morning. Also, early in your life. I look at our teenagers and young folks here. Be satisfied with God early now. Or just say, this is all I want. I just want to be satisfied with God and His mercies. That's, if I don't make the football team, I'm going to be satisfied with God and His mercy. If I'm not voted the most, whatever the most is these days, I'll be satisfied with His mercy. If the only person I can get to sign my yearbook, the young person, is the goofiest guy in class, I'm going to be satisfied with his mercies. Go in, because once you do that, because the goal is being satisfied with his mercy early in your life or any stage of your life, is that then you can build a tale worth telling. But if I'm not satisfied with God, if God's not enough satisfying me, then in my life my tale won't be worth telling. Very quickly, we must live a delightful life. Decide to be satisfied. Problems will come. Yes, afflictions are going to come. Yeah, that's what he said. But he said, I want gladness and rejoicing. Uh, the trials are going to come. Yes, but I want to be glad and rejoicing. So, be satisfied. Number two, be sunny. Be sunny. How many have been around somebody that's glad in the Lord all the time? Don't you like being around folks that are glad in the Lord? Aren't you glad... No. Well, we'll leave your spouse out of it. But anyway, it's, it's sunny. Notice what it says. Verse 15, make us glad. According to the days therein there has been afflicted, that has afflicted us. You've afflicted us, but make us glad accordingly. Give us days that are glad in that. Give, make us glad in spite of that. And the years wherein we have seen evil. Verse 14, oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Rejoice and be glad all our days. I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. 
God's satisfied. God's to be my satisfaction. I'm on my way to heaven, and I've got just a flash in the pan, just a moment to serve God. My life is going to be so quick and so gone. I'm going to be with Him for all eternity, a thousand years. I'll look back at just as a flash in the pan. So, oh, but preacher, I didn't, get my, I didn't get the car I wanted. Whoopee. Man, I'm going to be glad. I'm going to be glad and rejoice according even in the bad days. Be sunny, be joyful, be a help for people. Not only that, but be stable. If I'm going to have a delightful life, I'm going to have a life, a tale worth telling. I need to be stable in my life. Notice what it says. Verse 14, O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we will rejoice and be glad some of our days. Is that what it says, class? All our days. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit, but we need to be just stable, glad and rejoicing all our days. 14, 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. They're dead, but their works are following. They're dead, but their works are still going on. They're dead, but their works follow them. That's the idea of having a tail. When your gas casket is here, or your urn is here, or your picture's here at some memorial service, and they're talking about the t your tail that you spent your years doing, be worth telling because how you built it. Your works follow them. God knows about them, even if the world forgets about them, but God doesn't. But our effect goes on. You may be here in church this morning, you may be a Christian child of God because that great great grandparent you never even heard of took his family to church but brought your, this family to church that brought you into church and you're in church today you're on your way to heaven because you know Christ the Savior because somebody way back started that in your family their works follow them and that's a tale worth telling we may not know it all now and tell it here but in heaven we'll be have some tales worth telling I hope I hope that's not just a tale had good vacations could play a mean video game or is it a tale worth telling look at verse 9 and we'll be closed for our days are passed away they're passing in thy wrath we spend our years as a tale that is told what tale is your life telling? Can't change the past, but starting today, we said, my life's going to be a tale worth telling starting today. But it starts by getting saved. There's no life with a tale much worth telling that's not from a person who knows Christ as Savior, not sure they're on their way to heaven. See, the Bible says we can know we're going to heaven, not by being a Baptist, not by being good, but by being born again. See, the Bible says we're all sinners. You're a rotten sinner just like me, just like the one sitting next to you and in front of you, rotten sinners. The wages of sin is death, a place called hell. But God commendeth His love toward us that while we were those rotten sinners, Christ died for us. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, say, yep, He's God, and believe in thy heart that God raised Him from the dead, it means He died, was buried, and rose again for me, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from hell. Saved from eternity in hell. Saved to spend eternity with Christ. Having the Holy Spirit come inside. Our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. A mansion prepared for us in heaven. And more, again, more importantly, we can dwell in the everlasting to everlasting God. Wow. There's a tale worth telling. If you're not saved today, you need to be saved today. In a moment, we'll have an invitation. We'll invite you to come. Well, if a man with a man, lady with a lady, take the word of God and show you from the Bible how to be saved. Won't scare you, won't pressure you, won't do strange things. Just share the scripture. If you're watching by live stream or watching by YouTube in the future, you need to find somebody to show you how to be saved. It's simply by faith and trusting what Christ has done. Are you saved? If you are, how's your tail coming? We're spending our years building our tail. Let's bow our heads, please.